Hone and I run um, our BISO team. So that's the team of people who looks after client security at ThoughtWorks. So all of the work that our, our delivery teams are doing and how they keep that secure, that's our responsibility. And we're going to talk to you today about the best part of our job, which is running the Security Champions program. Um, and we'll explain a bit about what that is and how we make sure it's successful. And in fact, some of the results that we've seen from that, and it is a, it is a very positive story. We'll also try and call out some of the, some of the mishaps that we've had along the way. It's, a, it's been an iterative process to get to where we are. Um, so we're going to try and give you some information that hopefully can help you improve security on your own projects and potentially advocate for security champions programs uh, where you work. So we'll start with what a security champion is. Can you raise your hand if you've heard the phrase security champion before? Okay, yeah, a few of you, not everyone. So we'll just take a step back to talk about why security champions programs usually come about. And it's pretty basic, but most organizations have the same security problems. The first one is taste brushing. When I was putting these, these slides together and I started looking for images that could represent hygiene, I looked up toothbrushing and uh, I very quickly found some very confronting pictures of very brown and damaged teeth. And, and I decided that was a bit, a bit unpleasant for the first slide. So we went with this much more boring but representative image of toothbrushing. Uh, what this represents in the technology context is the things that you have probably seen going wrong forgetting to patch your libraries uh, and committing secrets to Git, uh, stuff like that. But everyone has these problems and they, they're usually um, broad in scale. So the second problem is visibility, uh, or rather lack thereof. Security is sort of this vague concept to a lot of people. And we're all sitting on a foundation that is invisible. So what we need to do is make, make visible those problems, those basic hygiene problems that people are not aware of at the moment. And that's another reason why we start looking at security champions programs. The other thing is that um, we have, what, 100 developers to one security team member. I mean, that's just not something that you can scale with, right? Um, and that is a problem that you'll see in almost every organization, right? I mean, you would have a security team, but you can't have like, one for like two developers or something. It's just crazy to be thinking about that kind of an investment as well. So there is always going to be a scale problem. If you're thinking that um, a security team is going to come in and be with you while you're developing your project, support you in shifting left with your practices, what does that even mean? Um, so scaling would never be an option uh, with that, right? And uh, the other problem is that we usually tend to think that security is rocket science. It's something which is hard and the compl there are many complications if it actually materializes into a problem. And uh, that is why we don't want to deal with this. We want someone who is a specialist to come in and always help with security. It's just too hard to figure out where all we could be going wrong. The first thing that you probably think of when you hear the word security is fun, right? This is what everyone agrees. Security <laughs> is fun. Uh, actually, probably not, but that, but that, is, uh, that is something that we aim for because we're, we're trying to get lots of people excited about security to get stuff moving. But what I was actually going to say is most people think security is important. It's very rare that you would hear an executive or a manager say, I don't really care about security because that's, like, that's a pretty surefire way to limit your career. Um, so we do have this, this sort of baked in support. Everyone thinks security is important. Uh, they can't really see what the problem problems are, but they know that there's a big risk there. They need to kind of manage it. Um, and that works in our favor usually. The mantra of security teams often is security is everyone's responsibility. It's not just up to the security team to keep your organization secure. Everyone has a role to play. But there is a bit of a problem with that mantra, which I refer you to this poem to understand. It seemed to be a job that anybody could have done if anybody thought he was supposed to be the one. But since everybody recognized that anybody could, everybody took for granted that somebody would. And this is really about the more people you have responsible for something, the harder it is for anyone to actually take responsibility and accountability and do it. And so you need someone to be wearing a security hat. 
enter security champions that we are proposing here. Where you are in a team, there are different <coughs> types of roles, there are different types of people that you would have that constitutes a team. You'll have QAs, BAs, devs, PMs, and you need someone to wear that hat. So who do you choose to wear that hat? The answer is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what their role is. It doesn't matter where they're coming from. What matters uh, when you're choosing this person is to say that, are they enthusiastic about embedding security into the team? Are they connected enough to look uh, across the different roles in the team and help build that security practices in the team itself? So when you're suggesting um, or you're choosing or nominating a person to wear that security hat, um, you definitely need someone who is going to be connected to the rest of the team, the rest of the roles. Um, in an agile setup, it's probably much easier because you're working closely. Communication is a part of how you work every day. Um, what we have seen with some of our clients is that when you have a waterfall setup, um, it becomes a little bit more difficult. So you might want to consciously choose a role which uh, would be able to have that coordination. The things that we are talking about is that they're looking to coordinate the security effort. Um, they're looking to facilitate a common understanding of risks on the team. And they are looking to ensure that good practices, the tool implementations are all there in the team. So if you notice closely, what they're doing is they're coordinating, facilitating, and ensuring good practices. We have consciously not said that they do it. We are not saying that the security champions are the ones that do what they, you know, uh, to, to do the steps of taking security implementation. They ensure that it happens. And which is why it is not specific to the role that you need a security specialist to have in this. So throughout this talk, I mentioned we're going to call out some mishaps and things that go wrong. In addition to running the ThoughtWorks Security Champions program, uh, Harane and I have both been involved in client security champions programs as well. So some, we're taking lessons from some of those as we talk. Um, one, one common gotcha or thing that goes wrong is trying to overload the champion with responsibilities. Once you have identified someone as the security champion, it's very easy to say, this is the security person. Anything to do with security, ask them to fix it. And, uh, and obviously, that's not what we're aiming for. As we said at the start, we're, we're aiming to scale the security team. We're not expecting the security champions to become security specialists. We're expecting them to coach and advocate for security within the team. So that brings us to the second section, which is building a high impact security champions program. We understand what security champions are. Uh, some of you already knew what it was. We hope that the rest of you also are on the same page now. Um, so what does it mean to build a high uh, impact program? And this we are speaking from our experience, as Robin was saying that we have learned through iterations. It's not that we knew what to do on the first go itself. It's actually our experience across the years. <clears throat> so we will be talking about five broad areas uh, of how you can build the security champion program that will actually add value. Um, we'll go through each one of them, but I have a quick question for you. So now that you understand what security champions are, um, we have, you know, for any organization, these would be four broad categories if you're thinking about security, right? You would have a security team, you would have maybe a community of security enthusiasts, um, also including maybe your security SMEs in there. Uh, you have, of course, the business who thinks about the voice of the customer, the money and revenues and everything. And then you have the project, the project team that you're actually working with. Um, where do you think the security champion program should sit uh, out of all of these four places? Everywhere. Okay. Why do you say that? I think there's an element of security in all parts of business. Okay. So, yes, that is the right answer. That <laughs> that though the security champion sits at the project level, I mean, but the program is what you plan for across all of this. And this is because what the vision is overall is to build a security ecosystem. So going back to Ankit's talk, if you were around at that time in the morning, we are talking of a systems thinking, right? We are saying that everything works together. 
there is a symbiotic relation between any any aspect that you pick out of this in the business and there is an impact and there is a there is a, a relation that would happen based on whatever you're changing in one place why this is important to understand as a larger vision is because it means that when you're thinking about building the program you cannot just build the part where the security champion sits which is the project you have to actually plan for the overall thing what does it mean for each aspect of the business so to take an example um, we'll talk about threat modeling so threat modeling is a practice that allows us to think about security on a project in context of a system so we typically we run these as workshops and we will draw up the system architecture perhaps with data flow and then think about what can go wrong using different prompts to help people figure out the you know the types of attack security threats that might occur and then the protections that they have in place to try to protect against them for example like having having things in place to detect when you have out of date libraries uh, so that practice if we were to introduce that on the project we would think about what would be the value of the outcomes for the whole the whole ecosystem so with this information the the business is going to have a better ability to make risk-based decisions because the the people who are working on that specific project are going to understand their risk and they're going to be making better decisions themselves the there'll be a reduced cost of defect because you're you're able to figure these things out before they go wrong so you're you're developing for them as you build rather than bolting it on later the community has skill growth because as part of introducing this practice we're also going to help teach people how to use it how to run these sessions and what to do in those sessions um, and uh, and there'll be collaboration opportunities between people in the community so they can help each other out the security team will get better visibility of the risk which is something we really like we like to see those benches we're sat on that is the first part which is uh, designing for the ecosystem the second part is growing just enough of the skills that the champions need. And we're using that word grow intentionally. So at ThoughtWorks, we have a capability model that helps us think about the types of skills that people have. This is sort of a subset of that model specifically related to security champions. And these are the types of skills that we want security champions to build. Uh, so they fit into three broad categories. So Probably when, when you think of security, people tend to think of the technical security skills like being able to hack or do penetration testing um, or uh, you know, enabling firewall rules or, or building, um, uh, building a secrets management service, connecting to the right place, putting a secrets in the right place, that kind of stuff. So that would all come under securing applications. Um, then we have information security skills. These are, the, these are the more generic security skills. So they're not necessarily about software development, but they're about security. An example of that is incident response, something we take very seriously at ThoughtWorks is if we have any kind of security issue, even a very low grade, no impact kind of problem, we still treat it as, a, as an issue and we work through root cause analysis and figure out what we can do to put in place uh, protections to prevent things from recurring. Um, so we're not expecting security champions to become incident response experts. That's like a whole profession in itself. But uh, we do want them to know just enough to know when there is a security incident and how to like kick off the process and get the right people involved. Um, and then influencing and persuasion. Like one of the one of the biggest challenges with security is persuading people to care. <laughs> so. So we really want the people who are taking on this role on the team to learn how to influence the people around them and persuade them that, that security is important. Because as I was saying that you know, everyone knows security is important. That's true in the exec level. It kind of withers away by the time it gets to the project manager level sometimes. And then it's a lot easier to prioritize feature work than it is to prioritize security work when the security work isn't visible. So that persuasion skill is important. So we're trying to build just enough capability in all of these areas with, uh, with the security champions. And we do that by enabling them through training, but also giving them the right experiences so that they're learning as they go. And there is a gotcha here, which is when, when you say to a team, hey, uh, we're making sure that every team has security champions. Could you let us know who your security champion is? Sometimes they go, we're very busy right now. Uh, 
can we just get the intern to do this? It's just some paperwork, right? Uh, and of course, we have to push back on that. Um, we have to make visible this kind of capability um, development opportunity. Like it is, it is an important thing for developers and other people in the tech industry to learn about security. And it's a, it's a value add for the team, but it's a value add for them personally as well. You, you can earn more money, frankly, if you have a security feather in your hat when you go to your next employer. And that is actually one of the things that we have seen more often than you would believe, because um, it goes back to the whole, you know, the psychology of the team, the people who are nominating, they keep thinking about security either being too simplistic or too much of an expert's problem. So the folks who think that it is something that we just need, if it's all about security hygiene, why can't we just get an intern to do it? It just happens so often. So part three the people, um, security champions in themselves are a social change. Like the, the reason why we use that structure is there's a, a, people have a preference for proximity. So if you, if you are looking to ask someone for help, the first person you ask is a person sat next to you. Um, it's much more likely that someone is going to ask for help from someone on their team than to reach out to the security team who could be in another country. So all of the, everything we do in the Security Champions program is to benefit from the human system, the organization of people. Uh, but it doesn't just affect the security champions. So when we're designing these, these, um, these interventions, we need to consider the whole, the whole business and, and, the, and figure out who, who to engage and how to get them on board. Um, so this is a tool we use for doing that. It's just called a stakeholder map. It's a tool we're both familiar with because we've been consultants, and this is something you do when you go onto a new account, figure out who, who you've got to talk to. So, um, so I'm not going to explain exactly how this, how this was put together, but I just wanted to make the point that we have uh, different methods of engaging for the people who are sort of core to, the, core to the approach, which is the security champions and the people running the program and the security team, and then the people who we need to engage to get support from. The thing that goes wrong here often is you don't get the executive support that you need. And this, this is a real challenge. And the reason it's challenging is you can, you can start from the bottom up, right? We can, we can go and talk to our first team and say, hey, we want to start the security champion thing. Let's do that. But at some point, you need, uh, you need approval for the investment of getting people to spend time on security. And, um, and so it's very important that you're managing that consciously. So the way we do this, the way we make sure this works is we, we work iteratively. We start with that first team, we show value, and we will get to how we do that in a minute. But yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the thing. So we have the core group and then the people we consult and the people we inform, we have different um, communication structures for that. So one of the things that we want to highlight is that usually what happens is a uh, security champion program, if uh, you've heard of it in any other place, um, it would be a workshop. So you would have people come in, okay. you'll have people come in, you'll uh, probably have them uh, conduct a workshop, which, uh, which just talks about, you know, let's train them two days. Now you know everything about uh, security, go and do your thing, right, on projects. And the point is that that's not how security champions would work because the program actually is much larger than just a training. We're not saying that you don't need a training. We're saying that's a very small element of the larger program. The program lives till the time the project lives, right? Because the security champion is there with the project throughout. So which means that when you're designing the program, you will have to think about how do you ensure that there is continuous learning, there is continuous evolution? And one of the things that we should just all accept is that no two projects are ever going to be the same. You're going to have your own experiences. Um, so if you have a security champion in project A um, and you have one in project B, they might have similar experiences on some account, but it'll never be the same. So you cannot teach one main thing and expect that it'll just work for everyone. So you need to employ a method that you decentralize security decision making. It is really hard. It is harder than um, it is harder said than done. 
because we usually tend to think that security is so important and the consequences can be so bad that we don't want to let uh, let it in the hands of the teams or we don't want to decentralize it but it doesn't work that way and that is why what you can do is you can centralize governance and when i say governance it doesn't mean that you keep a check you monitor and you policing and so essentially people are not taking their decisions that's not what it means it means that when people are there on the projects they will still need guidance they will need direction you don't want them to be you know all over the place so you want to give that right support um and see that it is still in alignment with where the business is going um so so that can help at both the levels uh, from where you can bring in a picture from the business it also means that you need someone closer to the account who will be able to drive the idea of where the where the project is going you know where the uh where the overall uh development is headed towards um so that is one of the key things to just accept that it they, there has to be decentralization of security decisions and the second thing is to think about uh, leveraging the power of cohorts what happens is usually when you are putting everybody in a room and you have um let's say a trainer you always tend to think that they are the people who know what they have to talk about what we did differently was that we accepted that the people who are sitting in the audience like yourselves have your own experiences you have your own thoughts and those experiences are what can teach each other better so if we are bringing people together what we should try for is that we should try and get the cohorts to actually speak with each other share and learn from each other um also building a community of people that people can reach out to um also again going back to ankit's uh, talk where we were talking about asking for help um this makes that easier because this breaks that psychological barriers that you would have of reaching out to people beyond just the mentors that you're seeing on the on the board <clears throat> so putting all of that together what how we actually uh, did the um did run the program in was in phases so these were the strategic pillars we said that what we need to give more um uh more leverage to is to ensure that whatever we talk about has an experiential uh, aspect to it there should be something that people not just learn in theory but go back apply it on their projects and come back and see if it actually worked so keeping those pillars in mind um we did all the things that we talked about until now we we ensured that we are setting the tone from the top we are looking at opportunities and uh, constraints uh, for example you could have a constraint that people cannot come out of their projects for training uh, you know training sessions how do you deal with that so your program structure the construct would change based on what constraints you have but you still want to make um the opportunities available uh there essentially so there were essentially four such phases where we talked about preparation uh seeding in the right projects that readiness is important um when we talked about the onboarding phase one of the things that we that i've highlighted there is diverse mentoring uh what i mean is uh that it is not just uh you know the the people who are creating the program that you would uh that you would want people to be mentored by but let people have their experiences sometimes you need to push them through that program to ensure that they go and uh, interact with a larger community they uh, you, there are different kinds of um, projects that they could be learning from so you need to push them a little bit um, to at least get that initial uh, start and when it comes to governance you would see that we also pushed for a sponsor relationship with the security champion this is important because as we said the security champion is something that will live through the life of the project which means that you need someone closer to the project uh who can sponsor for the success of the security champion on the project otherwise what we have seen is that the security champion would do all the shouting and at some point you'll start the, the team will start blocking them out um so you need someone who is a stronger voice um uh, and they would liaise with the um uh, if if you're in a services industry then with your clients with the security team and ensure that the security champion is continuously successful 
um and community is a very very important thing that um, that was very core and central to the way that we built the program um and this is something that uh, again is more long living it is beyond the people uh, who are in that community at a certain time so it is something which helps across and then of course we can talk a little bit more about how we <clears throat> measured continuous improvement and evolution so speaking of that uh we said at the start you want to kind of know what you're trying to achieve and be able to measure that uh there was a talk earlier on where people were discussing outcomes versus output we've obviously aimed for outcomes here hopefully this is value that we're delivering we're trying not to measure the wrong thing so we don't want to measure for example the number of security champions that we've trained or the number of security champions that we have uh that might look good for a short period of time to say look we're doing stuff but doesn't actually translate into ROI or um or value in this case being reduced security risk so you may be curious about why they are what they are so the first one uh is the first two kind of go together so the surprising one maybe is we want the number of incidents to go up the reason we want the number of incidents to go up is largely we depend on people reporting incidents to uh, improve. So if you see the number of incidents go up, we take that as a positive sign that we are discovering more security problems and therefore fixing them uh, before they become bigger problems. Uh, conversely, we want the number of incidents that get reported by clients to be reduced. And the reason for that is generally, generally speaking, if the client has found it, that means the security champions program has failed because <laughs> because it's got far enough that it's in the client systems and you know in production and bad things ensue so so we want to drive that down um the third one is a is a sort of a progress metric so it it's the number of pipelines that we've integrated tools with i haven't mentioned that so far but one of the things that we tip, that we do as part of the security champions program is getting tools into the ci cd pipeline so that we can you know, detect secrets in code or detect out of date on uh, libraries, et cetera. So that getting that, those tools into as many pipelines as, pro as possible and resolving the findings that come up, that is actually a reduction in security risk. So, um, so there's that one. And then the final one that sort of everyone, everyone is really keen for is let's not have any security defects in production. Uh, and so ideally we reduce that. The problem with, uh, most of these is they're quite slow um the so if you if you look at these too quickly and you expect you know overnight or over a, a, even a month or two for these numbers to change a lot they won't the they are lagging indicators so it takes a while for the impact of the security champions program to be seen so you do have to and we have had to that's what going back to the people stakeholder map thing having a structure of communicating these metrics in such a way that it is clear that it's going to take some time to have an impact. Um, and referring back to Ankit's talk, the, the, there will be some variation there, but over time, we're going to see positive trends on these. We have to get people comfortable with that. Anyway, so, so the results of our program over a period of time, the first one is over a six month period. So we did reduce the number of incidents reported by clients by 80%. That's a pretty good um, return on investment, considering the actual return on investment was very small. It was about getting people to, to do stuff rather than buying stuff. The number of incidents reported also increased quite dramatically. Again, very positive for us. We now know that these problems are there. We can fix them over time. That means less and less incidents reported by clients. And we've hit over a thousand pipelines. That's in a twelve-month period in um, in one market. So, and this one, <laughs> you don't have the comparison, but the number of uh, critical security defects is is zero in this period since we implemented it. So, that's good too. So one of the things. Uh, so if you could go back. So when we were writing an abstract for this talk, uh, we actually wrote this in the abstract because we thought this. Uh, would make us get selected for, for this talk. <laughs> um, it's because uh, this is what attracts value, right? It, it shows that this was a valuable program. This is what measuring this makes sense. Um, and, the, and it attracts um, uh, an audience because uh, what we are 
what we are essentially talking about or we are, you know, if you're not able to show that value, which finally makes sense that you can take back to your business for, for your time's worth, for the security champion's time's worth, it really wouldn't make much sense, right? I mean, what is, what is uh, saying that we have trained 200 security champions mean really? For all you know, there were probably just five security champions behind these numbers, but do you care? So it, it helps to actually think about what is it that gives that value and measure that. So uh, bringing all of those five things uh, together, uh, it's just a summary slide if you want to take a picture. But we talked about saying that you set your vision at an ecosystem level. You need to, um, you need to accept that a change in one part will have an impact on the others. So when you're uh, planning for this, make a conscious uh, decision in your plan. Um, the second is looking at the security champion skills. And when you're, uh, you're planning for that, make it outcome based. Uh, the third point that we made was that it's all about the people. Um, if uh, people are not convinced about uh, consuming your program, it will not work. You'll probably run one or two iterations and it'll fail after that. Um, so target it so that people know what is the, uh, what is the worth of this uh, program to run and what does it mean for them. Uh, the fourth point is that it's not a train and deploy. You have to keep iterating. You have to uh, learn over the phases. And this is something that will keep evolving. And the fifth is keep measuring so that you know where you're headed. So that um, is essentially how we build a program which not only gave those metrics, but um, also backed as an award. We won the CSO 50 award, which I think is tonight in US. Yeah, so we, we have that for this program. Cool, thank you so much.